Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to Middletown Presbyterian Church this morning. Uh, a couple of things to bring to your attention. Uh, probably at some point during the service, you are going to be smelling some delightful aromas uh, coming up from downstairs because immediately after the service, uh, the youth are hosting a pancake breakfast downstairs. So please feel free to come and join us for that. Um, also this afternoon uh, is a pool party for the children's ministries, uh, and that will be over at Rocky Run uh, YMCA at 1 o'clock uh, this afternoon. So uh, all of those uh, kids who uh, are involved in various programs, join uh, Mrs. Benson and everybody over at Rocky Run for that. Um, tomorrow is actually a busy day, uh, even though it is, uh, for some, a holiday, Martin Luther King Day. Uh, However, we do have a cook-in tomorrow, Aid for Friends. Uh, a bunch of uh, kids from Pencrest are coming over as uh, service hours and uh, working uh, with us to, to prepare meals for Aid for Friends. However, I believe we do need some adult, uh, do we still need some adults to help out? Uh, so if anybody is available and interested in coming to help with the, the cook-in tomorrow, uh, you can see Carol Curtis, who is in the back uh, on the left-hand side of, well, actually, your right-hand side uh, <clears throat> back there. Uh, so uh, please see her if you would be available tomorrow. This week, we do begin our adult Bible study again. So Bible study begins uh, again this Wednesday, uh, 9.30 in the morning and 7 o'clock in the evening. Uh, so come join us for that. Also, uh, also tomorrow is uh, Primetime Plus. Uh, so uh, they're meeting at noon in the chapel, uh, and uh, it's the, the topic is, is music by Gershwin, uh, and I believe that our own Jan Wooden and Bernadine Steinmetz, and uh, is there somebody else? Oh, and, and uh, Lindy Lommers and Mary D Diamond are uh, all going to be sharing uh, their musical talents, so come for some lunch and for uh, some great musical entertainment, uh, and come join us for prime time. Uh, Lisa, great timing. <coughs> it's time for the Super Bowl. The S O U P E R Bowl. Yes. Not that big game thing that's happening for the Yeah, whatever that 2nd. is. Now, although I did discover, I think I'm going to root for the Adels, Seattle Seahawks if they make it because they got a guy on there that's deaf. So this is like a huge thing. He's the first one. So I'm going to root for the Seattle Seahawks. All right? There we go. Good morning. Good morning. The Super Bowl caring continues. This is week three. And I do thank you for your continued support of the Super Bowl caring. It is to support the food banks. So on top of that, thank you for supporting the food banks throughout the entire year. I did last week forget to mention two little things. One is the history of Super Bowl caring. It started in the mid to late 90s. No, this one was early to mid 90s where youth group in the South were sick and tired of the millions of dollars being spent on the Super Bowl commercials. I don't know how much they are this year, but they got sick and tired of it. So they started their own big game day called the Super Bowl of Caring. Bring in your canned soups, they'll deliver it to people who can't even afford a can of soup. You know, you got people spending millions on a commercial and down the road you got people who can't afford a can of soup. They didn't like that. It caught on, it went national, it is now global. There's a website for it guys, okay? So, the other thing I wanted to mention was if you can't do the shopping, we will do it for you. That's why we were out there last week collecting money. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to mention that. So, there will be two cans, one for the adults, one for the youth. Last year, we came probably the closest I've ever seen it in the whole history of Middletown. And Middletown picked it up in the mid to late 90s and made it into a little friendly competition. And I want to stress on the word friendly. Last year, we were, if I got this right, a touchdown and a two-point conversion. That's eight. Eight difference between the adults and the youth, and the adults won. Youth, you still got another year. Come on. And the youth can include anybody who's as young as Riley. Yep, yeah, there's Riley. Could include anybody that's in school somehow. Could include people my age or Doug's age. Anyone who's right young at middle. heart. Young at heart. Age ain't nothing but a number, okay? How do you feel this week? So, last week, 
You feel young back there? <laughs> no. <laughs> Last week, the youth collected $45. I don't know the exact number, but it's mixed in with your grand total for the week, which was 156. Add that into 269. Your grand total so far is 425. Okay? The adults got a little catching up to do. The, how much? Whatever the amount was, $27, I think, got 65 items. Plus, and that's included in your 186 for this week, plus the, I, I had some extra since I did the numbers. Your grand total so far is 304. So, not big, a little catching up to do, but not bad. We still got some time. There's plenty of choices. Remember last week I did my little thing. If you go to the left, you can go save a lot, come back on Kmart, Dollar Store, and Giant, and Pathmark. And then you get Acme and you say hi to Cheryl and Sam. They're up there today. <laughs> Giant, don't forget, you can see Sheila Schreffler to get gift cards, and it helps out the youth group as well. And Giant has 10 for 10 Del Monte canned vegetables. You can get some for yourself, get some to the Super Bowl caring. Acme, I think, is the other one, has 10 for 10 on Ronzoni Pasta. You can do the same thing. There's other great sales going on. I was like, I can't write them all down. <laughs> So again, thank you, thank you, thank you for your continued support of the Super Bowl of Caring. Thank you for your continued support of the food banks. I'll be here next week. Until then, go Seahawks. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Lisa. <clears throat> Some of you may know I was away on study leave this past week, uh, and so uh, was hoping to not have to, to work on a sermon. So uh, a good friend of mine, Alan Mattinger is going to be our preacher this morning. He has preached here once before, so some of you might uh, remember him. He was uh, formerly the, the youth director uh, at Church of the Covenant, that I, where I came from, uh, and then uh, with Rivercross. He has now sort of retired from that as he and his wife have started their own youth group with two little ones. Uh, and he, seeing as he has a, a real day job uh, working for WSFS, uh, he wanted to spend some more time with his family. So, uh, but he has graciously uh, offered to come and preach for us this morning, so we welcome Alan, and uh, I think that's all of our announcements for this morning, so I'd invite you all to stand as we sing together uh, our gathering song, How Can I Keep From Singing? The words are on the insert in your bulletin.
Please join me in the call to worship. Happy are those who make their Lord their trust. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. You are my help and my deliverer, O oh my God. Let us worship our great God. may be seated. God's word tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him <coughs> should not perish but should have life everlasting. With that in mind, let us come before God's throne of mercy and grace to confess our sins trusting that he will be faithful to forgive us. Let us pray together the prayer of confession found in your bulletin. Let us pray. O God, you have shown us the way of life through your Son, Jesus Christ. We confess with shame our slowness to learn of him, our failure to follow him, and our reluctance to bear the cross. Have mercy on us, Lord and forgive us. We confess the poverty of our worship, our neglect of fellowship and of the means of grace, our hesitating witness for Christ, our evasion of responsibilities in our service, our imperfect stewardship of your gifts. Have mercy on us, Lord, and forgive us. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but rather that the world might be saved through him. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. 
in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Please remain standing as we sing our next chorus, uh, Friend of God. The words are on the insert in your bulletin. If you do have a yellow prayer card, if you would pass those toward the center aisle where the head usher can collect them. Uh, and if the children would come down front and uh, sit on the steps here for the children's sermon while we sing. be seated. That was great, Angel. I have a question. What is the best part of school for you? Hmm, that's a tough decision. Annie, Catherine. My favorite part is going outside sometimes. Great. Her favorite part is going outside. Anyone else? Juliana. Favorite is social studies. Her favorite is social studies. Great. Anyone else? Riley's thinking hard. Angel? My favorite is going to special music because I love to sing. I know you love to sing. I love watching you sing also. Uh, Juliana, you have something else? Reading. And reading. Great. Well, you know, when I was little, you know what my special thing to do was? Show and tell. I would love, and I'd be so excited to bring something in to share with the teacher and the other boys and girls and then tell about it because it was important to me. Now I asked Julie, I'm not, not Julie, 
I asked Riley and Michael to bring something in for show and tell. Riley, what did you bring in? A tabule. And what does that do? Um, I don't know. Why is it so important to you? I don't know. Do you use it? Do you use it a lot? No, no. Okay, how about you, Michael? What did you bring for show and tell? And an electric guitar. An electric guitar. Have you started lessons yet? No? That is really special. Wow. Well, there is a man named John in the Bible who loved to do show and tell with Jesus. He loved to tell others about Jesus. Now, there were, he had a crowd of people with him, and all of a sudden, he saw Jesus coming towards him. And he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he said, I can see and I testify that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, boys and girls, just like John told about Jesus, God wants us to tell others about Jesus, too, to show and tell how important Jesus is to us. Just like my things were important, and I shared them with my teacher and my um, brothers and sisters and those in my classroom, God wants us to share about Jesus. But one of the things God wants us to do is it's show by our behavior to be kind and be loving and care about others. And so many people followed Jesus because of John sharing about and showing who Jesus was. It might be hard sometimes to do that, but we can ask God to give us strength to share about Jesus, or we can invite them to church, and we can tell them how to learn about God and, and learn about Jesus' Son. So right now, we're going to ask God to help us. Um, we're going to pray and help us to share our faith and share about Jesus. Will you pray with me? Dear Father, we thank you so much that you sent your son Jesus um, as our Savior. Help us, Lord, to do the right things, to be loving and kind so others can see Jesus in us and they'll want to know you. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may go to enrichment. Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 49, verses 1 through 7, and that can be found in your pew Bibles on page 526. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you people from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord, and my reward with my God. And now the Lord says, he who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, to one despised, abhorred by the nations, the slave of rulers. Kings shall see and stand up, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Alan Madiger, as Pastor Doug shared. Um, I had a privilege of working alongside Pastor Doug for about five or six years at um, Presbyterian Church of the Covenant in Wilmington, Delaware, um, which was an amazing experience getting to work on staff um, with Pastor Doug. And also during that time, I had the, the wonderful privilege of having both of his daughters um, as a part of my youth group, um, which, again, was just a privilege and something that, something that I'm never going to forget, an experience I'm never going to forget. I'm really just thankful for for the, the opportunity and the time that I was able to have with them. Um, as you guys know, Pastor Doug, is, he's, he's such a man of God. He's such a family man and, and just a man of integrity. And so you guys are just really blessed to have him here as your pastor. Um, I'm, I'm from Middletown myself, Middletown, Delaware, that is, though, not Middletown, Pennsylvania. Um, and I'm, I live there with my wife. We've been married for 10 years, now a little over 10 years. And we have two kids, um, a seven-year-old son named Jack, and an almost two-year-old daughter named Molly. And let me tell you, I love being a dad. It is like one of the coolest things that ever happened to me. I love having um, my kids around and, and just getting to play with them. Um, but growing up, I used to, growing up, I got into um, soccer. That was kind of my big thing growing up. That was the sport that I liked. I didn't get into it until a little bit later on in my life. I was in um, elementary school by the time I got in a lot of my friends had started um, a lot earlier but I was able to play soccer through high school and um, I wasn't great at it but I loved it um, and so when I ended high school I did what pretty much everybody who's not good at a sport but really loves it I went and took a class and I became a referee for that sport and um, and I really had a great time doing that I got to travel a lot over the country and I and and kind of it, it just it just kept my passion alive for the sport and when when my son was born um, my son was born, it, it kind of, that, that kind of transferred to him. My son is really, really into sports. He loves sports. And I follow a soccer team in the English League called Arsenal. And I would say I'm an Arsenal supporter, or a lot of people would say fan. That's what we hear a lot over here with the football teams. Uh, but I'm an Arsenal supporter. And from the time he was born, him and I used to, would watch this soccer team play. Um, on the weekends, every Saturday or Sunday mornings, whenever they happen to play. And even, I mean, we have pictures of him from when we were two weeks old in his, in his Arsenal jersey, and, and we would sit there and, you know, we would sit down and we watch. It's just something that I get to enjoy with my son every weekend, and I just, I, I really loved it. Well, he started really getting into the sports, and he would, he would put his jersey on, but he wouldn't just sit there and watch it anymore. He would be running around our living room, playing with the players. So when he saw when there was a shot on the television, he would shoot in our living room, <laughs> which was pretty scary for both of us with, um, with the stuff that we have in our living room and hitting the TV and stuff. But he just loved to run around and play. And I'll, I'll never forget, one day I came downstairs, and normally before the game he has to do his warm-up because he's got to get ready. So he's running around his living room warming up for a soccer game. Well, this time I came down, and he's sitting on the couch. I'm like... Buddy, you got to warm up for your soccer game. You know, you got to get ready to, to play your soccer game. I said, what, what's going on? He goes, Dad, the coach benched me today. <laughs> so, so he's sitting on the couch, and he tells us the coach benched him. Well, just a couple months ago, we're, again, we're down, and, and we're watching Arsenal play, and, and, and they're doing well. Well, this time, all of a sudden, he disappears upstairs. He runs upstairs, and I'm like, this is unusual. Where in the world did he go? Like, he, he runs upstairs. And he comes back down, and he's wearing dress pants and a collared shirt and a tie and a jacket and, like, his dress pants. Now, my son does not like to wear jeans or dress pants or anything like that. But he comes down, and he's all dressed up, and he's decked to the nines. And I'm like, what's going on? And, and he comes up to me, and he goes, Daddy, 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 who do you think I am? Who do you think I am? Now, if you're a parent or if you've, if you've got a grandparent or you just have kids in your lives, little kids, and they ask you this question, you know that that's the pressure cooker, right, when they ask you that question? Because you don't want to let them down. You don't want to let them down. You want to make sure I want to answer them. I want to I I know what he's doing, and I want to build them up, and I want to encourage them. Um, but I, I'm like, Lord, help me. I don't know what this is. I, I, I want to encourage them. I was like, buddy, I'm sorry. I love your outfit, but I, I just don't know you know, who you are. And he goes, Daddy, I'm Arsene Wenger, which is Arsenal's coach, who also wears a coat and tie during the game. So he came down and, and, he, and he came down and he was dressed as Arsene Wenger, who was the coach, in a coat and tie, which was a new experience. But the question that he asked me when he said, who do you think I am? Who do you think I am? It's an interesting question. It can be a, a, a very tough question to answer for us, when, depending on the context when we get asked this question. Um, but it could be an important question, too, and I want to talk a little bit about that today. So we're going to start in Mark chapter 8, 
So if, you're, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Mark chapter 8, verse 27. That's where we're going to start. And we're going to look at Jesus and what he did in this passage. Now, prior to this passage, Jesus fed the 4,000. He healed a blind man. He stood up for people who didn't fit in for society. And we're now at a time where Jesus is really trying to prepare his disciples for what's going to happen, for his, his death and his resurrection that are coming up. So he gets them away, and he, they go about 25 miles north of Galilee to a place called Caesarea Philippi. Now, this place was like the Walmart of religions, okay? They had everything. Why in the world would Jesus go there? They had like every religion imaginable. But there was not a more symbolic place to ask the questions that Jesus was about to ask. He had some interactions in the villages, but he really wanted to spend some time with his guys. He wanted to, to invest some time in his disciples. And he's there, and he really wants them to be prepared for this crucifixion that's coming up. So when we get to Mark 8, that's what's going on. Um, and then we get to verse 27. So in Mark chapter 8, verse 27, it says, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? Who do people say that I am? Now, this wasn't the, I don't think this was the real question that Jesus was, wanted to ask, but this was, this was kind of how he set it up. He wasn't, he wasn't um, taking a poll here, okay? He wasn't trying to figure out, how's my ministry doing? You know, maybe if I'm being a little too bold I, and they tell me that, then I need to kind of adjust what I'm doing. That's not what he was doing. He wasn't going to, he wasn't, going to, you know, back off from that. He, what, he was, I think he was really setting up the next question here. But it's interesting to me to be, if I was in that circle right there when Jesus asked that question, when he said, who do people say I am? I mean, can you imagine being in the middle of that circle right there? I, I just wonder, do you think anybody just like spoke right up and answered him right away? I can't imagine that they would. I bet it was like kind of waiting, if you've kind of been in that awkward silence where you're waiting for somebody else to answer when that question comes out, I bet you it was something like that. And, um, and then it's like, you know, um, well, who do people say that we are? And everybody's kind of looking at each other and they're like, well, Peter, you know, you know it all. Why don't you go ahead and answer him? So, so somebody just answer the man. So finally somebody steps up and somebody says, John the Baptist. And then the others are like, good answer, good answer, yeah, um, I'm John the Baptist. Um, and then somebody else gets a little bold. One of them, somebody says, one of the prophets, or Elijah. I can just kind of hear this building, and now they're really kind of getting into it. And they're starting to come up with their answers. But then, when that happens, that's when Jesus gets to the real question. The real question comes in verse 29, when Jesus says, but what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Jesus gets personal here, right? Who do you say that I am? Well, Peter comes back right away, and Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. It's a pretty great answer to come back with, right? I mean, right off the top, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. Peter was put on the spot, but he was able to come back with this answer. And in, in Matthew, in this part in Matthew, in 16, 17, um, Jesus responds by saying, Blessed are you, Simon, of jo son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Peter said, you are the Messiah. You are the Son of the living God. But what about you? What about me? Who do we say that Jesus is? Who do we say that Jesus is? Now, a lot of people would say that Jesus is a good man, right? He was a good person. He had some really great teachings. When it's, as a youth leader, I, get, I hear that a whole lot. He's a great man. He's got, he's got a lot of great teachings that are out there. You know, he created the golden rule. You know, that's, that's pretty awesome. He created the golden rule. He was a friend of the poor. But Jesus kept asserting that he was God. He kept calling himself the son of man. This this decent man, this decent man, Jesus, he kept using these I am statements, which was a title for God in the Old Testament. He claimed to forgive sins. He, was, he claimed he was greater than Abraham and John the Baptist. He claimed to be so much more than just a good man. A person who claims to be God can't just be a good man. C.S. Lewis um, argued that, if, that there are three options that we have here to consider. He says, first, Jesus was a liar or a fraud. 
He was a liar. He was a manipulator. But if you read through the scriptures, Jesus performed over 36 miracles recorded in the Bible. And he never made any money or took a penny for anything he did. And look at the church. Look where we are today and how the church has exploded from that initial church that started back then. I just can't come down there that Jesus was a liar or a fraud. Well, then C.S. Lewis says you've, you've got a second option. And your second option is that Jesus was a lunatic. Or he was a lunatic. He was a madman. He was crazy. He was disturbed. But people were devoted to him. And they weren't becoming power hungry and they weren't becoming murderers. Jesus won the admiration of men and women and people from all levels of the social structure. No one around led and taught like Jesus did. He didn't make people into lunatics. He made them better with, with taking some common fishermen, common fishermen who ultimately wrote some of the most revered books in human history. So I can't really come down there either where Jesus was a lunatic. It just it doesn't reconcile for me. So C.S. Lewis says that we have a third option. And the third option is that Jesus is the Son of God. He did miraculous things with a wonderful heart, showing he was a tender, compassionate person who befriended and, and truly helped people. He really walked alongside people. I think Peter said it correctly for all of us when he said, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus went to the cross on a hill named after a human skull, showing what he thought of us. That's how deeply he loved us, that he gave his life for us. So who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say Jesus is? Well, if you say that Jesus is the Son of God, it really has to be more than words. It starts to change us when we, say, when we make that statement. When we say that Jesus is the Son of God, Jesus will start to change us. It'll change how we live. It'll change how we act. It's, it's, it's more than just words. And Jesus wanted his disciples to realize that it was more than just words. I mean, the words were who he, the, the words, the answer was right, but it's more than that. Saying Jesus is the Son of God is more than that. So as he goes on in verse 31, Verses 31 and 32, he says, He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. He was sharing this with his disciples. He wasn't trying to hide it with them. He was being upfront about what was going to happen. We're going to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to die. He's telling them this. And then after three days, I'm going to rise again. And then in verse 32, it says that, that Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now, this, this is interesting. Jesus says, I want you to know what's going to happen. I want, I want you to understand what's going to happen here. And Peter says, no, 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 no. Hey, come over here. That's not a good plan. One minute, Peter's saying, Jesus, you're the son of the loving God. You're all powerful. You're God. You have all authority. You can defeat everything. But wait a second, your plan stinks. Jesus was wanting them to understand that it's more than just saying you're the son of God. It has to transfer at some point into understanding what that means. So in verse 33, when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he actually rebuked Peter. He said, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And then I realized... I'm a lot like Peter. You know, when people ask me, who do you think Jesus is? If they said, Alan, who do you think Jesus is? Oh, I'll say he's the Son of God. I will say that. But then, but then the Holy Spirit will probably, or Jesus will, Jesus will say something that I'm supposed to do. Like, I'll, I'm supposed to forgive someone. There's someone in my life who wronged me, and, and I, I'm supposed to forgive them. And I'll be like, mm, that's not really a good plan for me. I got a better idea. Or he tells me I need to live a certain way and, and act a certain way. And, and one minute I can say Jesus is the Son of God. And the next minute I can go, yeah, um, well, maybe not. At least by the way I act. At least by my actions and the way I'm responding to that. I wonder if anybody else has that problem too. Where our personal agendas or our, our personal holdups that we have can really get in our way. 
So what does it look like in our lives to say that Jesus is the Son of God? To make that claim, what does that look like in our lives? And Jesus starts to change us. Well, our lives start to look like Jesus' life. Now, for me, I know some people, this can happen in the blink of an eye, right? It can happen immediately, and it's like, and, and they can change. That's not how it works for me, okay? For me, this is a process, and it's a painful process for me. It's an ongoing process. So I want to just, uh, just ask some questions this morning, just share some questions to kind of help us think about this and think about what this looks like. And I hope these questions can help us take the phrase, you are the son of the living God, from just churchy words that we hear to the way we actually live it out on a daily basis. So question number one, who do I say Jesus is by my words? Who do I say Jesus is by my words? Now, I'm not talking about the, the churchy answers to some specific questions. I think most of us could answer, if I were to say, who was Jesus? Most of us would say, he's Savior, he's Lord. I think most of us would come back with that. My son would probably say, duh, Daddy, he's the Son of God. That's what it says on your sermon. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Um, some of us, we may try to show off. Right? We may say, oh, he's the lion of Judah. Or, we, or he, we may say, we may look up some passages in the scripture that not many people are familiar with, and we may, we may share a name like that. But, but that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about the words that people hear me say when I'm not in worship on Sunday, when I'm not at church. Those are the words that I'm talking about. Are my conversations that I have, are they conversations of faith and trust and truth? I'm talking about the words that people actually hear me say. In Matthew 12, 36 and 37, Jesus says, But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. I have to ask, do my words pre present grace and forgiveness and kindness? Or do my words present criticism and prejudice and judgment and meanness to take an inventory of that what kind of things do my words present psalm 1914 is probably one that a lot of you are familiar with or have heard before it says may these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight lord my rock and my redeemer i can't say jesus is the son of god when i come in here to worship on sunday and then walk out during the week and be a mean and hateful person with my words. It doesn't reconcile. The one contradicts the other. In Mark chapter 8, verse 38, a few verses later, Jesus says, If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Ashamed? That's just, that, that's a harsh word. I get the chills when I hear that. Ashamed. The, word that, the words that God wants us to speak, the things that he wants us to say, um, our answers have to be more than just cliches. They have to be more than just churchy answers, and they have to be more than just cute Facebook posts. Our words need to be life-giving and not life-sucking. So that's the first question by my words. Second question, who do I say Jesus is by my perspective? by my perspective, my attitudes about life and death, the views I take on good things and the views I take on bad things. Those attitudes, those perspectives, will have more to say to people that we believe that Jesus is God's son and that he defeated death than probably anything else that we do. In Ephesians, Paul said you've got to get a new attitude. He literally says you have to take off the old one and put on a new one. If you say Jesus is the Son of God, if I say that Jesus is the Son of God, my perspective should start to change. If we, if we say that Jesus is the Son of God, then our perspective about life should be completely different from those who don't say, make that claim. For someone to say that I believe Jesus is the Son of God and then have a negative, critical, eori type, everything is bad, poor, miserable me attitude is contradictory. You can't say Jesus is Lord and live your life saying everything bad is going to happen to me all the time. They just don't go together. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that every promise that he gave us 
is going to be true. Every promise that he gave us is going to be true. Perspective is crucial. So by your perspective, who do others think Jesus is? By my perspective, who do others think Jesus is? If you have no hope, why would anybody want that kind of Jesus? If you have no positive outlook on life, why would anybody want that, that Jesus? If Jesus is Lord, if we make that claim, then our perspective matters and it starts to change. The third question that I want to share with you is, who do I say Jesus is by my schedule? Okay? My schedule. Now, this one's pretty straightforward, right? This one's pretty easy to know with your schedule. I think most of us would know that. Several times, but several times, people came to Jesus and said, oh, I want to follow you, but I've got something else I just need to take care of first. And I realized, it's interesting, because I, I read that, and I'm like, what are they doing? I'm like, the Son of God is like right in front of them, and they're like, oh, I just got to take care of this one thing, and then I got to follow them. But I do the same thing with my schedule. I do the exact same thing with my schedule. When I was in um, elementary and, and middle school, I had a really close friend, and we rode the bus together, and we loved, the, you know, we loved to hang out with each other. We were always playing football after school and, and doing homework together, and we were pretty much inseparable. My parents would literally have to rip us apart. Um, and it was just, it was, I really just loved to spend time with him, and, and it was just kind of, he was, he, was, he was by far the best friend that I had. And when we went to high school, his family moved to Maryland. They moved pretty far, pretty far away in Maryland um, from where we were, and I didn't get to see him anymore. And we stopped having contact, and we didn't talk anymore. And so three years had passed, and I'm a junior in high school at this point. And I got a knock at the door, and I answered the door, and it was my friend Peter who showed up at the door to say hi, which really took me back because it had been three years. And I hadn't seen him, and he looked all disheveled. I mean, he looked, like, not good. He, he, his eyes, he had, like, rings under his eyes, and he was scruffy, and you could tell, and his clothes were real frumpy, and it was just like, you, you knew it, something was wrong here. It just, it just didn't, some things just didn't add up. And um, I remember it, the reason I remember this so distinctly is because that was, that was the first time that I really remember feeling the Holy Spirit prompting me. Now, I didn't know that it was the Holy Spirit, okay? I had no idea what that was. But I had this feeling that invite him in and talk to him. And it was like, it's, it's hard to explain, but it was just like this overwhelming sense that I need to bring him in, I need to sit him down, and we just need to talk and catch up and have a good time. But I had a lot of homework to do, and my favorite TV show, Friends, was coming on that night, okay? <laughs> Friends was coming on that night. And I had a lot of homework that I had to get done in order to watch that. And that was the new episodes of Friends, okay, <laughs> back when that was going on. And, um, and I had a lot of things that I wanted to do. And so I'm like, do I, do I bring him in? Because now that's going to push my homework back. And then I'm probably, and we didn't have DVR, okay. There wasn't just an option to hit a record button. You had to pull out the VCR tape and, and hit the record button. It was a whole process. And so I didn't want to go through that process. So I was like, I was really struggling with it. And I decided, you know what, I need to get my homework done. And I, and I didn't, and I said, Peter, I'm sorry. Maybe we can catch up again soon. You know, call me. We'll, we'll do lunch. We'll catch up. We'll talk. And um, he went on about his way. Well, about three months later, I found out that Peter had OD'd on heroin and had died, um, which, which rocked me. Now, I'm not telling you the story to suggest that if I invited Peter into my house, he would be alive today. And I'm not telling it to you because I, I carry a lot of guilt for it. But the reason I share this story with you is because God used that to teach me some very crucial things. Number one, the Holy Spirit is always prompting us. We've always got to be aware of the Holy Spirit prompting us to step out and to risk something for God. And the second thing is that our time is short. And when we get that prompting, we need to step out. We need to be willing to step out and make adjustments to our schedule and, and do something with it. When Jesus calls us to do something, it may not fit into our schedule. I was a junior in high school at the time, okay? That's how young I was. When, God call, when Jesus calls us to do something, it, just, it, it may not fit into our schedule. And in that situation, my schedule trumped Jesus. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. If Jesus is God's son, then maybe other things shouldn't bump him. Maybe other things just shouldn't bump him. Maybe I shouldn't make excuses for not taking the opportunities, excuses that I've used like I'm busy 
or I'm, I'm, I gotta go to work, or I'm in the middle of my job right now, my, my job's too busy and I, and I can't do it, or, or I'm too tired, I have, you know, I have two kids and they, and they run me ragged and then I get really tired at night and things like that. I've, I've got a lot of great excuses, trust me. But if I say that Jesus is the Son of God, shouldn't my schedule reflect that? Shouldn't my schedule reflect that Jesus is the Son of God? Shouldn't my schedule say to people around me that Jesus is important to me? That's question number three. Number four, who do I say Jesus is by my actions? Who do I say he is by my actions? Actions are what people see. We've all heard our actions speak louder than words, right? We've all heard that, that saying. In John 14, 23, Jesus says, if anyone loves me, he'll obey my teachings. That means the hard ones too. That means the hard ones too. So by my actions, if I say Jesus is the son of God, and I have someone in my life that I haven't forgiven, he's not. If I say Jesus is the Son of God and I do selfish things instead of things that he calls me to do or, or I don't have the heart he has or, or for, for other things or for, or for the people that he's got, then he's not. Where do we risk something for God? Where do I risk something for God? Where do you risk something for God? I had the, when I was in college, I had a unique opportunity, a wonderful opportunity to go on a mission trip, well, a short week-long mission trip with an organization called Appalachian Service Project, or ASP, if any of you guys have heard it. And we would go down to Chavez, Kentucky, and we were able to do like hard, turn, hard construction, which is not my strength, but I'm a computer guy. Okay, you want electronics? I'll fix it. You want like home improvement stuff? You call somebody else, okay? But I, I went on this mission trip when I was in college. I, I got talked into it. And um, we went down there, and I was a brand new Christian. I had just become a Christian at the time. And um, it was a wonderful experience. It was a wonderful week. God really showed up, and he was doing a lot of things um, with me. And I remember, I remember it because the one thing that I always had a hard time on then was praying out loud and sharing my faith with other people, especially my family, especially my family for some reason. It was so hard for me to get over that. And I remember going down there, and I remember, like, we're sitting in this group, and they're like, Al, will you pray? And I'm like, yeah, okay. I guess I'm going to have to step up and do this. <laughs> and so I, I, just, I did. I stepped up and do it. And I started getting comfortable doing it. And we're, we're sharing with the families of the homes that we're working on, and we're talking to them, and they're telling me about their faith. And I'm like, and I'm sharing with them, and we're having these amazing conversations, and it was just, it was incredible. The relationships that you build when you start sharing that stuff, it's just, it's so deep. Well, then we came back, and I came back to my job, and I came back to school, and I came back to my family, and I came back to my friends. Wasn't so comfortable when we came back, let me tell you. I was afraid maybe I didn't know enough about the Bible. They're going to ask me questions about the Bible, and what am I going to say if I don't know the answer? Or, or just, especially with my family, I'm going to look stupid. I'm going to look stupid sharing this stuff about God with them. They're going to look at me like, what in the world are you talking about? But it's interesting because several months later, I finally worked up the courage to start really sharing. And it took me a while, and I was talking to myself through this, and um, yeah, it was just, it was an interesting process. But I finally got the confidence to do this, and to go to share with my family, and to share with friends, and things like that. And, and people, at co-workers, I would talk to people at, at work. And it was amazing how my, the relationships I had with these people started to change. And they started to get so deep. I started having people to work. People at work were coming into my office and closing the door, and they're like, Alan, i got to talk to you about some stuff that's going on in my life. I'm like, what? <laughs> I mean, it was like, it was crazy. My family, who I was most concerned about, I was like, when I sit down with them, what are they going to think? And how are they going to act? How are my brothers going to respond to this kind of stuff? How are my parents going to respond to this? And it was amazing, the response that I got. It was amazing how Jesus just... just worked on their hearts, too, and how deep are our relationships just because of stepping out and risking something, something like that. So our actions are, are crucial. Our actions are crucial. That's question number four. Last question. Who do I say Jesus is by my priorities? Who do I say Jesus is by my priorities? Now, this really is the confrontation that happened with Peter, I think. This is really what he nailed Peter on because Peter's priorities were different from Jesus' priorities. Jesus is trying to lay out a plan for his disciples. He was saying, okay, guys, here's what's going to happen. Okay, here's what's coming. Here's what's going to happen. And Peter goes, no, wait a minute. I got a better plan, and it does not include you dying. 
Okay, that's what Peter's response was. I think there's probably a better way that we can, we can do this. Peter was saying, when he when making that statement, Peter was saying, my priorities, how I feel and what I think are more important than yours. They're more important than yours. I catch myself saying that a lot. Maybe not with those exact words, but I live that. I live that. In Mark chapter 10, I want to read you a passage. Um, it's from Mark chapter 10, and it's verse, verses 17 to 23. And it's um, the rich young man. You probably are familiar with the story. You've probably heard it before. It says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. Teacher, he declared, all those I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. I love that statement. He looked at him and he loved him. One thing you lack, he said, Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? Now, when I hear this, when I would always hear this, this, this passage shared in church, I've got to be honest, I've got a confession. This is my safe place up here so I can share this confession. I rolled my eyes. I did. Because I'm like, great, the pastor's going to tell me I need to sell everything that I own and move to you know, some foreign country and, and become a missionary. That was always kind of my, my reaction to it. And that's not what I'm saying here. I'm not, talking about, I'm not saying that having stuff is bad or anything. That's not why I share the story with it. Having stuff isn't bad. But what's your God? What's your God? Jesus knew exactly where this man's priorities were, right? He knew exactly where his priorities were. The one thing that this guy couldn't change, Jesus knew exactly what it was. What's that one thing for you? What's that one thing for me? That one thing that we just can't change. I think daily, daily, we need to say, my priorities need to be God's priorities. The people that God cares about need to be the people that I care about. Doing the things that God wants me to do to represent him, those things are what needs to be my priorities. I don't think when I get to heaven, God's going to say, I'm so glad you spent hours working on your yard. You really honored me with your grass. I don't think he's going to say that. What's your priority that you will not miss? The priority that nothing takes the place of in your life. Are your priorities God's priorities? Are my priorities God's priorities? By your priorities, do you say, Jesus, you're the Son of God? Do you say that by your priorities? If we say that Jesus is the Son of God, our lives should be different. Our lives should start changing. Jesus starts to change us. Our lives begin to line up with the life of Jesus. We will speak life in the lives of others, in the lives of others with our words. We'll love the people that no one loves. We'll make time for the people that Jesus makes time for. We'll risk ourselves to follow Jesus wherever he leads us because the reward is well worth the risk. Now, it's not easy, but it's worth it. It's amazing where God can take us when we do this. So now let me ask you a question. Who do you say Jesus is? Let us stand together and sing our next chorus, Knowing You.
You may be seated. Let us pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for this morning. We give you thanks for this opportunity to gather and to worship you. We give you thanks for Alan and the message that he has brought this morning. Lord, help us. Help each one of us to truly consider that question. Who do we say that you are? You are the Son of God. And Lord, as the Son of God, we lift to you those things that concern and uh, those needs that we have. This morning we would lift to you um, Kim and uh, her parents who have been in an accident uh, last night. Um, uh, her mom is in ICU and the last that we heard, her dad was still being evaluated. Uh, but Lord, we just pray that you would be in their midst. Uh, Lord, that you would be um, giving them strength. Help them to know that you are, you are the Almighty God and that you hold them in your hands. And Lord, we also want to lift up Jenny, uh, who's going through chemotherapy, and uh, just pray for strength and healing and peace. Uh, and uh, Lord, uh, we know that uh, at least as long as she can, she would like to continue to, uh, to work and to do those things that she needs uh, to do. And we pray that you would give her the strength she needs as she goes through this therapy, uh, that she may continue uh, to do those things that you are calling her to do. Um, and Lord, we just uh, pray that you would be with her. Lord, we also uh, want to lift up uh, Cindy Boyer, and Lord, we just ask your blessing upon her and just pray that you would continue uh, to be with her. Uh, and Lord, there are many others on our hearts and minds that uh, we may not have shared publicly, but we lift to you uh, because we do believe in you and we do trust that you uh, will act. Uh, and we don't always understand uh, the choices that you make uh, and the, the way that you act, uh, but we trust that you are a good God and that you love us. And Lord, we just lift all of these concerns to you, trusting that you will be active in each life, in each situation. And Lord, we also just want to lift to you uh, thanksgiving for all of the many blessings that you pour out upon us each and every day. And Lord, we offer ourselves to you that you might fill us and that you might send us, that you might be working in us and through us. Uh, and Lord, we just look forward to seeing you at work in our lives. Lord, we lift all of these things to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If the ushers will now come forward, we will continue our worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings. If you are a visitor here with us today, please don't feel obligated to put anything in the plate. Your presence here among us is gift enough.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, every good and perfect gift comes from you. All that we are and all that we have belong to you. And we offer these gifts back to you that you might multiply them and use them to further your kingdom in this world, that they might bring you honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join hands for the benediction. Friends, you have been blessed by God, but you have been blessed with a purpose that you might be a blessing to others. So go out into God's world to bless all whom you meet with your story of what God has done for you. In Jesus' name, amen.